This morning, we, as I've mentioned before, we are going to be focusing on just two verses, but these are rather full verses, um, and we're actually only going to look at a couple of the ideas in them this morning, and we're going to look at some of the others uh, this evening. So really, during the entirety of this day, we're going to be focusing on this particular text, on the issue or the subject of worship. Let me begin by reading these two verses again. Jesus says, but an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. May the Lord bless uh, his word to our edification, our being built up into the image of his son this morning. Now, as you'll recall, we've been looking at what uh, Jesus did as our prophet, as our priest, and as our king. In this world, in order to save us and the work that he continues to do in these three offices in heaven, we saw that he came to show us the Father, he came to die to uh, reunite us with the Father. And he came to destroy our enemy on the cross, the one that kept us from the Father. But we also saw that when, when Jesus was exalted into heaven, that he continues his work from heaven in these three offices. He continues to teach us, uh, to show us how we are to live. He continues to pray for us. You know, we, we think about the Spirit's intercession for us, uh, interceding for us with words that are uh, too deep, or I should say groanings that are too deep for words. But Jesus Christ also is interceding for us, pleading the merits of his sacrifice for us on the cross. And that keeps us in the grace of God and gives us the power to live as the Lord would call us to live. And Jesus continues to rule over us from heaven to direct us in the good and the right way. As a matter of fact, his command to do what it is he calls us to do is not just because it's right, but because it's good for us. And it also, of course, allows the kingdom of heaven uh, to move forward. Now, we also saw this was last week as our king, that he also has another prerogative, and that is to judge those who hurt us. Uh, we saw last week in the morning that Jesus brought his judgment upon the Jews who were persecuting and injuring his people in 70 AD, not to mention the fact that they also took him, crucified him, threw him out of the vineyard. We know that there was judgment for that. God judges his enemies. When Jesus was, sat at the right hand of the Father, the Father gave him a promise that he was going to subdue all of his enemies under his feet. We also saw, though very briefly, that Jesus continues to do that from heaven every single day. Even right now, he is sending his judgments against those who stand against us. I know sometimes it looks more like we're the ones that have this tremendous army that are coming against us that makes it difficult for us to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. But the Lord is on our side, and the Lord is fighting the battle too. He is the captain who is leading us out, and he is going to defeat all of those enemies. Uh, Paul reminds us that his wrath is poured out continually from heaven every single day on those who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Then we also saw in the evening that one day he is coming to bring his wrath upon all who have persecuted his people throughout the centuries in the final judgment. So Jesus has saved us through his work on the cross, but in a very real sense, he is continuing to save us from all the dangers that we have to face on a day-by-day -day basis. But now what I would like us to do is simply back up perhaps a step and ask the question, why is the Lord doing all of these things for us? What is he, why is he doing this? What is his purpose? What is his goal behind all of these things? Well, this is one of these top-level truths the Bible gives to us that is an overarching principle that perhaps will help us to see more clearly what it is he's after and what it is then that we should be doing. What the Lord is seeking in all of this 
is that he might have worshipers who worship him in a particular way. Now, the Samaritan woman, as, as we see, knew at least this much about God that he desired worshipers and he desired worship. Which is why when she saw that Jesus was a prophet after he had declared to her everything that she had done, although she would see very shortly that he was much more than a prophet, she asked him about this very issue, about worship, because she knew that God took worship seriously. Specifically, she wanted to know where God is to be worshipped. She says, well, we Samaritans, and apparently didn't realize that the Samaritans really had a sort of a hybrid religion, sort of a mongrel kind of religion that really was not acceptable to God. She's asking in ignorance, but again, at least she knew God wanted to be worshipped. So she says, we believe God wants us to worship him here in this mountain. But you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship God. So Jesus, you're a prophet. Which of us is right? Well, Jesus, as you know, answers her question. But as we have come to expect from Jesus, Jesus always takes advantage of the opportunity to go beyond what is asked, especially because that question really wasn't as important as the one that he really does answer. Now, he does tell her the where is important. At least it was at that particular time because salvation was from the Jews. God has made his covenant with them, the children of Abraham. Jerusalem was the place where the Lord was pleased to put his name and where he wanted his people to worship him. But he says that there was something that was even more important than that, and that is how he would be worshipped rather than where he would be worshipped. Because the outward circumstances of worship, the location, you know, where it should take place, and the way that we would worship, you know, what are the things God wants us to do, these things were about to change. But there was one thing that wasn't going to change, which is really at the heart or the essence of true worship. And that is, of course, worship in spirit and in truth. So this morning, what I'd like us to do is focus on two things, at least two things from what we see in this passage. First of all, what worship actually is. And then secondly, how we are to worship the Lord, what it means to worship in spirit and in truth. So first of all, what does Jesus mean by worship? And here is where I think we can get a little bit confused, you know, using perhaps this word as synonymous for praise. I mean, is Jesus talking about, and is the, the question, because we might be led to think that from the question of the Samaritan woman, because she is talking about formal worship, when people get together and they sing praises to God and they pray and they sacrifice, at least in, in their day. Is that all he was talking about? Is, is that all that worship is, what we're doing right now? as we are sitting here, as we're thinking about what the Lord is saying, what's being said about what he said, as we're singing, as we're praying. Is he talking about this and maybe also what we do on Wednesdays when we get together to do essentially the same thing? We study the Bible, we discuss it, we pray, we sing praises. Is he talking about only what we do when we spend time with him in his word and in prayer in our personal devotions? Is that all that worship is? Well, that is worship, certainly, but Jesus means more than that by this word worship. Now, this word literally or essentially means this. It refers, first of all, to loyalty. It refers to faithfulness and devotion that we are to show to the one whom we have taken to be our God. It refers to faithfulness, to devotion. It refers to respect the respect that we are to show him, to the regard that we are to have for what he says. It refers to the fact that we are to believe what he says and that we are to listen carefully to what he says and to take what he says very seriously. Worship goes beyond the idea of devotion and listening and respect to the actual carrying out of what it is that he tells us to do, to the service that we are to give to him, in submitting to him, in, in doing what it is he calls us to do. 
So worship is really all of these things. Loyalty, devotion, faithfulness, which incorporates um, pretty much the, I, the, the first idea, respect, regard, but it's also service. But, of course, it's devotion and service given to the Lord in a particular way, which we're going to look at in just a couple of moments. Now, Jesus doesn't just say to the woman that she should worship. He also tells her whom it is or who it is she should worship. And it's no mystery, of course, whom we are to worship. Jesus tells us that we are to worship the Father. Notice he says in verse 23, But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. And then Jesus calls him God in verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Now, I only draw this particular point out because I know oftentimes we see Jesus making statements like this and maybe we're a little bit confused. Is Jesus telling us here that we should only worship the Father and not the Son and the Spirit? And that we're not to worship Jesus Christ? Is that what he is saying? No, but what he is meaning to say by this when he refers to the Father, that those who worship the Father, he's talking about the Father in the sense of the whole Godhead because the Father represents the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, just as Jesus represents his people. Jesus stands for us in the covenant of redemption. The Father stands for the Godhead, for the three persons of the triune God. He represents God. Jesus represents his people. The one that we are to worship, the one to whom we are to give our loyalty and our service is God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We worship a triune God. And we need to remember that. Sometimes, you know, we might focus as we were, well, reminded by Sinclair Ferguson. We focus maybe on one person in the Godhead uh, to the exclusion of the others. We, we need to worship all three. But I also want to point out that we are to worship Jesus because he is God the Son in our nature. He is to be worshipped as well. Now, you know Jehovah's Witnesses will challenge us on this point, but we know that this is the case. And certainly, what we see in the Scripture could not have been done, and Jesus would never have allowed it if he were a mere creature. We know he is more than than a creature. I mean, he became a creature. He became a man. A man is a creature. But that is the mystery of the incarnation and the great stoop that God makes on our behalf that the one who is the creator would become one of his creatures but he does not cease to be the creator and the eternal and divine son of God. You know, the Magi recognized this when they came to where the star was in Bethlehem, saw the babe lying in the manger. We read in Matthew 2, 11, they fell to the ground and worshipped him. They worshipped him because they knew that he was more than just a man. Think about the disciples when they saw Jesus walking on the water. And when he got into the boat, he rebukes the wind and the waves that they obey him. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? And they worshiped him. Again, Jesus would never have allowed that. Just like the angel, remember? When John uh, bowed down to worship the angel that was showing him the, the, the vision that he gave him in the book of Revelation, the angel said, get up and don't do that. I'm just a servant. The same way that you are of God. Worship God. But Jesus didn't say that. Jesus received their worship because he is God in human flesh. And of course, when Jesus revealed himself as the Son of Man to the blind man whose eyes he had opened, the man believed and he worshiped him. So worship is personal devotion and service to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to Jesus Christ who is the Son of God in our nature. It is devotion and service to God, not just on Sundays, not just on Wednesday nights and our personal times of devotion all combined, but at all times and in all places. Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 1, again, a very familiar passage. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, in light of all that he's done for you, to present your bodies a living and holy 
sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And he goes on to say, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Worship is what we are giving to the Lord now, what we're giving to him on Wednesday evenings, what we give to him in our prayer closets, but it is what we are to give him at all other times as well and in all other places that we may find ourselves and in every single decision that we make. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now, in the context, Paul is talking about whether you eat things sacrificed to idols and that type of thing. He says, make sure in your eating you don't stumble somebody, that you don't use your liberty to stumble somebody, and so forth. So he is referring to that in particular. But notice he says, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever it might be, do it all to the glory of God. Do it in the way that he tells you to do, because that is what glorifies him. In your devotion, have respect to his word, and then carry that out. So we are to worship the Lord with our whole life. And, of course, it is devotion and service to God at all times and in all places for a particular reason. It is because of who he is and because of what he's done. God does not call us to do something that he is not worthy of. God is infinitely holy, infinitely worthy, and he deserves all the devotion that we can give him, all the service that we can possibly offer to him. He's the one, as we know, who not only made us but takes care of us. And so we owe him a great debt of gratitude, but particularly because he saved us. Let's not forget that what we have as, a, as our glorious future was not given to us because we deserve it. And God didn't have to provide this. And what he provided he provided at a very, very great cost to himself. I mean, think, the Father loved us, and he gave that which was most precious to himself for us. The Son loved us, and he came, and he paid the price for us, as we're reminded on numerous occasions in John 3, 16 through 17. Let's not forget that all three persons of the Godhead are wrapped up into this passage for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world but that the world might be saved through him. Now it doesn't contradict what we've already seen. God is going to judge the world. God is judging the world. But that's not the reason why he sent Jesus into the world. He sent Jesus into the world to save the world but there are those, of course, who reject, who reject God, who reject the gospel, and they will end up being judged. But the Father loved us, gave us a son. The son loved us, laid down his life, and the Spirit loved us and loves us. And he has applied to us what Jesus did for us. The Spirit of God is really what Jesus lived and died to give us. We have a divine person living in our souls, and that relationship that we have is, how would you value something like that? How would you measure it on, on a scale? I mean, take, take uh, Mount Everest and turn it into pure gold. Is it worth that much? Is it worth more than that? What if the world were made of gold? What if the world were a giant diamond? What if the universe were filled with money? Can that compare to what the Lord has actually given to us and the treasure that we actually possess? That is why we should worship the Lord, because he has given us these things. Now, these things are only true of him. Only he is worthy. Only he is the creator. Only he is the savior. And because of that, we should devote ourselves to him, to serve him only. Remember what, uh, when the devil tempted Jesus to worship him, what Jesus said in Matthew 4.10, go Satan, get out of here. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He is the only one who is worthy of our worship. So this is what worship is. Again, devotion and service 
to God at all times and in all places because of what the Lord has done. But secondly, Jesus would have us think, think a little bit more deeply about how we are to worship the Father, how we are to worship Him, how we are to worship His Spirit when He says that we must do this in spirit and in truth. Listen to what He says again in our text in John 4, 23 and 24. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, all the other things we've already seen about worship are still true. We need to be devoted to God, and we need to serve him at all times and all places for the things that he's done. But again, those things can be done and still not done in this way. There is something specific that the Lord is pointing out that is a, a change. Well, maybe not really a change. There are certain things that are changing. But I think from what we saw of Joshua this morning and what he encouraged the people of God to do, that that was true back then too. That is what the Lord wanted. So what does it mean to worship in spirit and in truth? Well, first of all, what does it mean to worship God in spirit? Uh, the, the text apparently isn't up there any longer, but, but think about the word spirit when he says spirit and in truth. I don't know if you noticed, but the word spirit was in lowercase. It wasn't in uppercase. When it's in uppercase, it refers to the Holy Spirit. When it's in lowercase, it's referring to spirit perhaps more generally. And I think in this case, the translators believe, and I think they may be right, that it's referring to our spirit, that we are to worship the Lord from within the inward part of man. Since God is a spirit, since he's spiritual in nature, since he's not a physical being like a statue or some golden idol, he's not a creature, he is to be worshipped in a particular way, not in a physical way. I mean, think, think in terms like this, people worshipping a totem pole and bringing maybe some fruits and vegetables or maybe bringing some kind of an animal to this physical thing and thinking somehow they're pleasing this physical thing with this physical gift. Well, that's not what the Lord wants. Really, that's what Paul was pointing out to the philosophers on Mars Hill because, you know, in, in Athens, it was a, uh, basically the seat of, of idolatry. Uh, we think about Greek mythology. They were heavily indoctrinated in it. But this is what he says to them in Acts 17, verses 24 and 25. The God who made the world and all things in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. Now I think what Jesus, remember he's talking to the Samaritan woman, I think what he's pointing out to her is that the majority of people who are worshiping him now, whether they're Samaritans or Israelites, we're, we're, we're doing exactly that. I mean, the Lord had given to the Jews a particular form of worship, but a lot of it was physical because it was types and shadows, and they thought that perhaps by going through these particular motions of doing what the Lord commanded or what the Samaritans were doing on their mountain of worship, that somehow that was pleasing to God just because they were doing the physical parts of it. But he's saying, no, what God desires is spiritual worship. He wants them to do it spiritually. He wants them to do it in faith from the inward man, offering to God service, you see. Now, Jesus was telling this woman that now the time had come when the worship of God was becoming more spiritual in nature. The physical parts of it were going to be stripped away. Now, we, we do still have some physical trappings, but I think you'll notice this doesn't look quite like the temple. You know, if you... Remember what the temple looks like. It was very ornate. You know, there's lots of, well, not so many bells. There were some bells, smells, uh, sights to see, gold, you know, and, and certainly fire and incense and burning sacrifices, a lot of physical stuff going on. But it's because it was a type and a shadow that was pointing beyond itself to the reality. And yet, the reality was there, there were some people who worshiped the Lord spiritually then who had faith and who were willing to offer to God what it is he really wanted, but most of them didn't because they couldn't see past 
the physical. But again, Jesus was saying that was going to be stripped away. And actually, if we stripped away all the physical elements of our surroundings right now, and we all ended up having to stand on, on you know, ground somewhere, on dirt, and we didn't have this amplification or any of these other things, we could still worship the Lord because we don't need physical things in order to do that. Our worship is spiritual. The reality had come. Jesus was going to fulfill the types and the shadows, and they were all going to be stripped away. And so we need to understand these circumstances are not important. The physical things are not important. And even the things that we are to do, I mean, the things he calls us to do, reading the word and singing and praying, sometimes those can be reduced down to just going through the motions. But that's not what the Lord wants. He wants us to be engaged in the inward man in faith, in worshiping him and offering to him not physical sacrifices, but spiritual sacrifices, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So what are these spiritual sacrifices? The fruit of lips, prayers, uh, listening to what the Lord says, and rendering obedience to what the Lord calls us to do. So we are to show our devotion to the Lord in a spiritual way. Not praying, to, again, towards a particular place. That particular place is gone. doesn't matter where we worship anymore. When Daniel was in Babylon, he would open up his window and he would face uh, the direction of, of Jerusalem and he would pray in that direction. We don't have to pray in that direction because the true temple of God is in heaven. Now we direct our praise, our prayers, and our devotion to the Lord towards heaven. That's one way we offer to him spiritual sacrifices. The other is, again, by obeying him, by serving, serving our brothers and sisters in Christ, serving our neighbors who are made in the image of God. Um, our worship is to be spiritual in nature. But then Jesus, and by the way, I should mention, you can't do that without the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit is involved, you know. We, we need the Spirit of God, but I think what is being referred to here is the kind of worship we are to offer Him. It's not like it was, it's changing. Okay, I should say changing the fact that the physical outward stuff is being taken away, but the spiritual reality remains. Now Jesus goes on to say that if we would worship God, we also need to worship Him in truth. Now we do need to worship Him according to His truth, we need to do what the Lord tells us to do in our worship here and our worship on Wednesday and our personal devotions in our lives as a whole. If the second commandment teaches us anything, it teaches us this. God desires to be worshipped in a particular way. That's true. But I don't think that that's really what Jesus is talking about here. At least that's not what he's focusing on. What he means here is that we are to worship him in sincerity in truth, in that sense. It's not to be a sham. It's supposed to be the true expression of what is really in our hearts. What's the difference between a hypocrite and somebody who is genuine? It's the motive behind it. God wants us to be true. He wants us to be sincere. Now, this amplifies a bit what he just said about worshiping him in spirit. He doesn't want formalism which means going through the forms of worship, just going through the rituals and doing certain things, and because we've done certain things, at least anybody looking at what we're doing might think, hey, this person really loves God because they're doing all these religious things. God doesn't want that. That can be just hypocrisy. He wants us really to love Him, sincerely to love Him in what we're doing. It's so difficult, isn't it, to get our eyes off the external things and, and to focus on the things that really matter, which are matters of the heart. But that is what is most important to God, is what's going on in our hearts. Think of the example when Jesse, excuse me, when Samuel went to Jesse's house to anoint the next king over Israel, and Jesse's oldest son walks in, and he's really tall, and he's, you know, just glowing with... Uh, his presence and so forth, and Samuel looked at him and he said, wow, <laughs> this, this is it, this is the guy, you know. And, but what did the Lord say to him? 
We read in 1 Samuel 16, 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And the problem is we still have that tendency, don't we? You know, we look at the outward appearance. We can't even see the heart. What matters to God is the heart. And so with regard to us, that's what we need to be focused on. It's not what God sees you doing so much. I mean, obviously, we shouldn't be sinning and doing the things he tells us not to do. But even when we're doing the things that he tells us to do, they still may not be pleasing to him. I mean, read 1 Corinthians 13. If I make all these great sacrifices and I have these great spiritual gifts, but I don't have love, then it profits nothing. David writes in Psalm 51, verse 6, Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being. And I think that is what Jesus is referring to here, worshiping in spirit and in truth, worshiping, offering to the Lord spiritual sacrifices that come from our hearts, a heart that is renewed by his grace. So it's not merely what we do that pleases God, but it's why we do what we do that really pleases him. He is looking at the heart. Jesus is telling the woman, God doesn't want outward religion. He wants inward religion. He doesn't want us to put on a show of holiness. He wants us really to love him in everything that he calls us to do. Now, we're going to stop here for now and we're going to finish this theme uh, this evening but I thought just on this one particular point perhaps we could look at just a couple of questions by which we can apply this and let me just simply ask this question and I'm asking it of all of us but let me ask you how does your worship measure up so far what does the Lord see when he looks beyond your outward actions beyond what you're saying beyond what you're doing, and he looks at your heart. Um, what does he see? Does he see love? Does he see devotion? When he looks at you, does he see you doing the right actions? I mean, it's not that the actions don't matter. We do need to be doing what the Lord calls us to do, but are you doing those things because you sincerely love him and want to please him? Well, Thankfully, if you are a believer here this morning, what the Lord sees when he looks at you is that love. He does see that sincerity. And the reason he sees it is because his spirit is living in you. But of course, we all recognize that even though that is true, we are not what we should be. Our love is not nearly as strong as it should be, as his worthiness and his love towards us really demands but it is there and it is real and it does please him this evening we're going to look at how we can cause that to grow how we can grow in worshiping the Lord in this way as we understand it perhaps a little bit better but let's at least be thankful God has given us the grace to be able to do it and let's purpose to be the kind of person he actually calls us to be but let me also say this, if you're not trusting Jesus this morning, you do need to know that he's not going to be pleased with anything that you might offer to him externally. I mean, you can go to the most religious institutions that have all the rituals and all the bells and smells and everything we talked about before, and you can go through all those rituals, but they're not going to please God. And you can even worship here, and you can go through what we're doing right here. You can listen, you can sit, you can pray, you can, you can sing. But if the heart is not right, if the reality is not there, then it's not going to please him. The only thing that you can do that would be pleasing to him is to obey the first command that he gives you, and that is repent, turn from your sins, and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you do that, that shows that God has given you what you need, actually, to do this, which is the Holy Spirit Jesus is the only one who can give you the Spirit of God. And without the Spirit of God, you cannot worship Him the way He would be worshipped in spirit and in truth. So don't try to replace what you really need to do with any amount of works or any amount of religious worship 
rituals and things like that, which people, as you know, as we look around the world, that is what they're doing. That is not acceptable to God. If you would be acceptable to him, come to Jesus, ask him for his Holy Spirit, be filled with the Spirit, and begin to serve him from the heart. That is what is pleasing to him. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us do what he's called us to do this morning.